Yeah. So should we just check we've got the last little final marks in there? Yes. Well, I did it all. I mean, exactly. um, I mean, it was a, it. We kept it our, I think, well, we we kept it our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Yes. So just um, right, can I just borrow your, your pen? Again? Yes, of course. A second. Yes. I think the Christmas speech is enormously important. This certainly is a, an historic one. It's the first one that hasn't been given by Queen Elizabeth for many, many, many years. Do you want me to do that one? Yeah. I'm standing here in this exquisite chapel of St. George at Windsor Castle, so close to where my beloved mother, the late Queen, is laid to rest with my dear father. I'm reminded of the deeply touching letters, cards and messages which so many of you have sent my wife and myself. And I cannot thank you enough for the love and sympathy you have shown our whole family. Okay. Is that? Yeah. With all my heart, I wish each of you a Christmas of peace, happiness, and everlasting light. We were right at the end of our summer holiday and my uh, phone went and my chief of staff just said, London Bridge. And I was an extraordinary moment. A few moments ago, Buckingham Palace announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. This is someone I'd known and deeply admired and respected. Someone who'd always been there. All the things that everyone else felt. Plus, I suddenly thought, everything we've practiced for, everything we thought about is now going to happen. In my case, it was purely serendipity that I was there. And I'd been in, um, two days up in, on the west coast and I was coming back, stayed the night, I was going south. We always enjoy being in you know, Bamal. We spent a lot of time there in our youth and there was, you know, a lot of it was probably more independent life than almost anywhere else. That's probably still true. That's a bonus. I think there was a moment when it, she, she felt that it, it would it would be more difficult if she died at Balmoral. The salad is ready. And I think we did try and persuade her that that shouldn't be part of the decision-making process. So I hope she felt that that was <laughs> that was right <laughs> in the end, because I think that we did. My mother's funeral in St. George's. When he takes the crown off the um, coffin, I, I rather weirdly felt a, felt a sense of relief. Somehow that's it, finished. But that was that responsibility being moved on. To my darling Mama, as you begin your last great journey to join my dear late Papa, I want simply to say this. Thank you. Thank you for your love and devotion to our family and to the family of nations you have served so diligently all these years. May flights of angels sing thee to thy rest.
to be honest, I'm not sure that anybody can really prepare themselves for that kind of change, not at least not easily. And then the change happens and you go, okay, yeah, I now have to get on with it. The plan is, is the two of them together yeah. in white, and then Her Majesty second, and then yeah. it still stays white, and yeah. then King Charles third, and then yeah. rotate it once to yeah. black. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The reign of King Charles and Queen Camilla is a new era in the history of the monarchy. At the heart of every successful reign, there's a strong partnership. To celebrate that bond, the king and queen are having their first official portraits taken by royal photographer Hugo Bernand. I think about every photograph I take, what is the information that the viewer is going to take from this? What are they going to feel? How are they going to interpret it? When you look at the photograph, I want you, the viewer, to feel like you're in conversation with the person in the photograph. And you're going to turn more towards the light. And you're on the spot. We've spent two days here practicing, lighting, kicking ideas around. It's almost like you guys aren't on the right spot. I'm sure you are. It's just that I'm, I'm not getting the red chair in, which I was getting before. So go a bit closer to, um, yeah, that's better. That's perfect. Work it, work it, work it, which is not what we're going to say to their majesties. <laughs> it's always fun. It's just always fun. We have a bit of a laugh, and I think we get nice pictures. Good morning, all of but Thank you so much sorry, for asking us. Yeah. Not at no, all, not at all. No, how, how are you? How are you? How are you? Nice to Nice to see you. Now, I'm just going to quickly let you know what we're doing. Yes. We're doing one picture here of the pair of you. Yes. Right. Then I'm going to do a picture with just you very quickly. Good, okay. So I'm going to ask you, sir, to step aside. Then Sorry. I'm going to do the opposite and I'm going to take one very quick picture of you on your own. Right. Now, toes, yours are together on that one. Yes. And then okay. um, I just need you to come back at fraction this way towards me to the <laughs> brilliant and so can you get your um that foot on that one Good Lord. and this is all so we don't have do pillars like coming it? out of people's heads or chandeliers coming yeah. out of ears it's incredibly well organized yeah. okay. one question i want to ask you yeah. is far away yeah. are we allowed to let that hand yes, yes, yes. is it allowed to go Absolutely. there yeah. Yeah. it's brilliant yeah oh yeah it's so nice this the daylight, we've got spring daylight, actually for real, but we've lit it as if it is just spring daylight. And so can you just turn very, oh yes, you did, just very fractionately that way, yes. that's it. Okay. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and sorry, to me, straight to me, like that, with that, I love it, I love it. That is how quick we are. Very good. The great thing about these particular pictures is they are the first official formal photographs, but they're not so formal. I am really pleased. I think they're really great people, and I want that character to come through. I just think they're both individually and together fantastic and i hope that some of that comes through in the pictures that's what i really want charles iii is not just king of the united kingdom he's also head of the commonwealth only weeks after his accession he's hosting one of its most important leaders the south african president cyril ramaphosa Monarchy is a 365 days a year occupation and it doesn't stop because you change monarchs for whatever reason. President Ramaphosa, welcome. Evsheni, Dumela, Suabona, Molo, Malweni, Nda. Wow. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, my wife and I are delighted to welcome you to Buckingham Palace this evening. 
but it's a big operation. The amount of entertainment is much bigger than even they recognised. But I think my brother, he's learning things about the organisation that he perhaps was only vaguely aware of before, and he's quite enjoying that too. The coronation has been scheduled for the 6th of May. So major alterations are underway on the treasures, which will be the centerpiece of the ceremony, the crown jewels. I'm Mark Appleby, and I'm crown jeweler, which means that I look after all the fantastic regalia, crowns, jewellery, and silverware in the Tower of London. On this occasion, we have been asked to modify three crowns for the up and coming coronation on May the 6th. Each monarch's head is a different shape. So for every coronation, the crowns must be adjusted to fit the king and queen. We need to remove as much of the pieces that detach before we start our modification. And at the moment, I'm in the midst of taking off the mond and the cross patty, which holds one of the most famous sapphires in the world, which date back to 1066, the St. Edward's Sapphire. The legend has it that it was worn by Edward the Confessor, and as he was being turned into Westminster, when they opened the coffin, he was still wearing this sapphire as a ring. So incredibly, it's found its way into our imperial state crown. One of the most spectacular jewels in the imperial state crown is a diamond known as Cullinan II. Cullinan number two comes from a large family of nine major stones. Um, it sits in the imperial state crown where its big brother sits in the sovereign scepter. This diamond weighs just under 320 carats. It's D color, it's a flawless diamond. It's just one of the, the most historic diamonds in the world. It's just so priceless that I don't think that you could put a value on that stone today. This is the St. Edward crown. It's the oldest piece of, almost the oldest piece of coronation regalia. It was made in 1660, modeled on a crown that was melted down courtesy of Oliver Cromwell. But this is entirely gold, 18 karat yellow gold, and it's incredibly heavy. It was reduced in size for George V. I've got to put those pieces back now to get it back up to size. Well, in many ways, this is the most important piece of all. We have the imperial state crown that everybody's familiar with. Her Majesty wore it for state openings and so forth. It's a very nice crown, but this is several centuries older. And the idea is that when this is placed upon someone's head, at that moment, that person becomes the monarch. So if you like, this is the object of coronation. One of the most important duties of a monarch is that of Commander-in-Chief. Leading our armed forces and supporting allies and friends. Today, the King is visiting Ukrainian troops who have been trained in the UK before being sent to the front line. Pleasure to meet you. Nice 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 to meet you.
most of them, they came from civilian lives and they have never been before the militaries and don't know how to manage but the weapons. And after the 35 days, they become a real soldiers who is ready to go to the front line. Good day, I'm Alex. I'm from Ukraine. I'm 32 years old. То я працював вчителем, мені подобалася моя професія. Географія, біологія. Зараз стою в лава Збройних сил України. Are you halfway through the course? Ви десь на половині свого курсу чи вже Так, так, половина, так. О, єс, ви just at the halfway point. They're working you quite hard. Ну, надіюсь, вони вас вижимають, так? Good, good, good. There's so much to learn. Yeah, there's a lot to learn during this period. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For me, it's a very exciting moment. I didn't expect that there would be a meeting with the Lord. It's a very important part in our life. І кожен би, напевно, хотів бути на моєму місці і мати таку унікальну можливість. Але я радий, що це випала саме ця часть мені. І це, власне, є зброї, які ви будете використовувати в Україні? Так, Калашникова. О, так, і власне, чую, що ви маєте багато копати тут. Ні, це немає, нам знадобиться в Україні. О, так, це дуже важливо. Зе кінг спілкував з ними, і, звісно, це мотивувало їх to fight better and better. Because if you're alone, it is difficult to fight. But we are not alone. Long live the king and thank for all your country. It isn't only the king who's shouldering new responsibilities. The queen is also taking on a range of new roles, including an association with one of the most decorated cavalry regiments in the British Army. Her Majesty the Queen has been appointed our Colonel-in-Chief, and this is really her first day in that role. I've been my father, Richard. My wife's Your Majesty. Well, it's lovely to see you. And Your Majesty. And on such a great day. I know. Oh, yeah, really exciting. Got <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hurrah. This is an official role with a personal connection. The Queen's father was a lancer during the Second World War. He was a troop leader in the 12th Lancers who took part in the Battle of El Alamein. He was chasing across the desert and um, decided to attack what he thought was some transport and logistics, fairly soft target. Turned out that it was actually Rommel's headquarters and was rather more heavily defended than he was expecting. Unfortunately, in the engagement, his vehicle was blown up, his gunner and driver were both killed. Uh, and he was seriously wounded. He got two military crosses, which is pretty unusual. So, yeah, very, very distinguished war record. Well, I'm sure wherever he is today, he would be absolutely thrilled that, you know, I was now doing this role. Well, we are equally thrilled, man. And today, there's an extra cause for celebration. Michael de Burr, a former Lancer, is a hundred years old. What Her Majesty is most interested in today is that you enjoy today, and of course, the really exciting and important celebration. To mark Michael's centenary, Queen Camilla has invited him to Clarence House. Where are the hands? Oh. There we are, Michael. Many no, congratulations. Thank you. How nice to oh. see you again. I'm so pleased. Uh, there you are. It's pretty yeah. showy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, birthday present, which is absolutely fantastic. I never expected anything of that sort, especially from lovely new queen. He, he's me up. No, 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 please don't. I'm coming down. Oh, no. I'm coming, I'm coming down, so you can't, so you can't get up. She's a lovely person, and we're very lucky to have her. 
I've known her a long time, off and on. Her understanding of her role and how much difference it makes to the king has been absolutely outstanding. And this role is not something that she she would have been a natural for, but she does it really well. Oh, that's well, it. Well. Oh. 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 Right the way back. Oh. Yeah. And she provides that change of speed and tone, which is equally important. During the coronation, Queen Camilla will be crowned alongside the king. With the coronation countdown underway, more than 20 embroiderers are working round the clock to finish the robe the Queen will wear as she leaves Westminster Abbey. Layers of gold thread and pearls are being sewn into four metres of velvet to a spectacular and very special design. We were very keen to tell a story, something that was very personal to her. So there's elements from childhood, birthdays, family, marriage. We've got myrtle, which symbolizes love. Chrysanthemums, joy, tenderness. We have our wild garden here on the bottom. And as the design travels up the robe, you'll notice we've got some beautiful spring flowers because May, a time of awakening and hope and new beginnings. Lily of the Valley, which were in her wedding bouquet. One of my favourite flowers, actually, is the barley here, which is representative of her childhood and growing up in the countryside. Nestled beautifully and not lost is Her Majesty's cipher here. Yeah, I hope she loves it. And they're going to show you around and the work that we've been doing. Oh, yes. So who did the actual design? Wow, well, well, the whole team here. Oh, whole team. So it was a bit of a collaboration, so we did lots of research. Wow. So a very naturalistic yes, yes. gardening theme, you'll yes, notice. Yes, yes. Some telphiniums. Oh, mm. very good. Well done. Yeah. And the butterflies yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, the little caterpillar over here. Oh, I'll come back in. Yeah. Oh, this is another. Um, what is that? A, no, uh, no, dandelion. That's a yes. dandelion. Yes. You see, look, <coughs> that's the yes. dandelions, Lizzie. Yes, exactly. They're very, oh, good, yes. Oh, look. Splendid. <laughs> the clock is also ticking for another group of artists whose work will take centre stage. The Ascension Choir has been chosen by the King. They're the first gospel singers to perform at a coronation. I was brought up with an appreciation for gospel music. It's one of the veins of music that really talks about the human condition. Today we are going to have our last solo rehearsal. Make sure that we are absolutely ready for the day. in the middle of making dinner and Bim calls me up and I just made a noise and it was the sort of noise my husband came running he was just like, you're right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yes. The answer is yes and whatever you need, yes. It was very special. My mother-in-law loves me. Praises unto our God. Sing praises, 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 praises unto our King. 
I mean, people ask you, have you met the king? Have you met? I mean, you meet the king, but you know, we're not talking about the football results and you know, he's not coming around my house for a cup of tea. You know, you meet him, it's for a limited amount of time. He's very nice. You're very nice. Um, it's very pleasant. He's very funny um, and um, very knowledgeable about music. I think it's important in, at such a, an amazing moment in the country's history to represent the beauty and the diversity that really exists, uh, you know, in the, in the United Kingdom. The king has a range of new responsibilities. But he also has historic commitments. One of these is to the organization which, for the last five decades, has borne his name the Prince's Trust. Set up to support underprivileged youngsters. It has now helped over 1.2 million people. Today, the King is meeting Prince's Trust award winners and patrons. Um, Your Majesty. Is it really you? <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Good to see you again. Your we missed you yesterday, Your Majesty. I'm so sorry about it. It wasn't so half as good a show without you. <laughs> 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 That's the problem. Yeah. So how many years have you done? That was our 11th yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Was it? yeah. yeah. you are astonishing. Yeah. Yeah. We love it. We love Amazing it. it. Love Amazing it. record of loyalty to <laughs> well. The King has also invited Prince's Trust beneficiaries from the past. You look the part, mate. You look like you just fell out of Debenham's window. Oh, thank you very much. If it was still in business. <laughs> People who were helped by the charity nearly 40 years ago. I left school in 78. Um, didn't do overly well in school. Wasn't motivated to do well. It was a very difficult place to get employment in Liverpool at the time. Most of the big employees had kind of left. So we were starting to see our, our fathers losing the jobs as well. There was no sense that you were going to get a job, so why bother looking? They were really dark times, I suppose. The only news that was coming out of Liverpool in the 1980s was bad news. Bad news. Your Majesty. Mr. Graham Ray. Nice to meet you. Ah. Yes, exactly. Good. Hello, sir. How are you Good doing? <laughs> Dave, did I not meet you? Yes, yes. 1986. I do remember. Yeah. Was it not yet? Come on, Katie. Was it being started? Rags and wipers. Rags and wipers, that's right. Wipers, sir, uh, yeah. Wipers. 38 years. 38 years. 38 years. You gave us £3,000 in 1986, mm. and it lasted 38 years. So we've created quite a substantial business up there. All yeah. down to you. It was a friend of mine who says, why don't you go and speak to the Prince's Trust? We didn't realise that it was the Prince of Wales who was behind it. They start asking me questions. What are you going to do? Impress me. Sell yourself to me. Something being there at that moment ignited something. And they said, they'll give you a thousand quid. Now, you either take it and run and go and get drunk with it, or you take it and go, I think I'll do something with it. This is Willy Wonka's ticket. So we just kept on going, kept on going, head down, kept on going. Since it began, 
Ray Brothers has employed more than 250 people. Oh, hardship as well. We've stayed in Toxteth. We've employed people from Toxteth. We built a business that lasts for 40 years. He made it possible. <laughs> I'm so good about that. That's been... Thanks, sir. It's, it's lovely to see you. The transformation now, what you're seeing now, to what it was when you gave you us know, that I money years ago, unbelievable. It's, it's a great move. All that Albert Gog oh, here, yeah. it's, 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 it's brilliant. You played your part, well done. What, in the... Uh, in everything? That's <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't want to blow smoke at the guy, but um, well, to tell you the truth, if I ever envied anything, I saw the, the, the palaces and, and uh, the wealth and the stuff like that. On my crib sheet, when I, I, I meet me mate and said, hang on a minute, I have the million kids here to actually come out from an underprivileged area. I changed yeah. a huge amount of people's lives. He has. That's where, that's my claim to fame. Yeah. The winners, if you let your hard work and your glee just rise up, <laughs> coming out of your cheek muscles and coming towards the cameras over here, and we are done. Thank you very much. With the coronation fast approaching, preparations are intensifying. Many of the items at the heart of the ceremony are handmade, including two pieces vital to the crowning of the king and queen. My name is Philip Tracy and I'm a hat designer. I got a phone call from the king's office to ask if I would do this. And it took me a few weeks to actually take in what was involved. I've had a great experience designing hats for incredible events and incredible moments. When you work with the royal family, you're working with history. It's a different dimension. Captain maintenance is a term that's been around since, I believe, the Middle Ages, and it is a term that was used for the cap which sits inside the crown. And the cap of maintenance is actually what fits the head. It basically stops the crown from becoming a necklace. So it actually is what's holding the crown on the head. We started by making a cross-section of Their Majesty's heads, and then we had exactly the template made in wood of the point of contact of the crown. This was the original lining from St. Edward's crown, so then we replicated because it's an ingenious way of keeping something very heavy on. It's a beautiful purple velvet. And then this is a white duchess satin. As we build up the layers of material, that starts to add up dramatically and suddenly something very two-dimensional becomes three-dimensional. It's fascinating to work on something like this because all fairy tales come from these crowns. Crowns and robes are eye-catching symbols. But coronation is first and foremost a religious ceremony. And the mysterious ritual which lies at its heart is anointment, when the monarch is touched with holy oil. It starts in Jewish history with the anointing of kings. So it's at least 3,000 years old. And that was always done as a symbol and sacrament of the Holy Spirit filling the person being anointed. For the coronation of Charles III, anointing oil is being sourced from the birthplace of Christianity.
some of these trees on the Mount of Olives, they go back to the time of Jesus. You know, we're talking about over 2,000 years old olive trees. And these trees have witnessed a lot. They may have held the hands of Jesus um, during his passion. These olives were picked prayerfully, knowing that you know the king will be anointed with this oil. After being picked and pressed, the oil is taken to the place where Jesus' body is said to have lain after crucifixion. That oil resembles God's wisdom given to the king in order to carry out his responsibilities as leader of the community, to lead God's people in all righteousness and all truth. By the power of thy spirit, bless and sanctify this oil, trying to be the king or the leader of everybody uh, is, is not an easy task. We will always pray for him. So this oil may be to King Charles a sign of joy and gladness. And I would think that this is his greatest gift, that he will be the king of all the British people. Now and forever. Amen. The route to the coronation was endless rehearsal. In the last couple of weeks, we went to Buckingham Palace and the ballroom was set up to scale. That is, oh, with all the names of the countries of the... Oh, I won't distract you. I hadn't seen it before, I just... Oh, okay. Admiring It's quite it. something. It is. Here we go then. Lift. I'm Sergeant Major David Roper from the Grenadier Guards. There's a point in the coronation where His Majesty the King will be anointed with oil. Uh, and my part is to command the six non-Christian officers from the Household Division who've been selected to bear what we call the anointing screen, which is a large screen that forms three sides of a square around the anointing so that the private part of the ceremony can be conducted. Right, we'll do screen one, then we'll do two and three as a one -er, okay? Raise. March. We've spent a lot of time rehearsing to make sure the choreography will be just so on the day. We've rehearsed on a nearly daily basis for about 10 days now, and of course that will heat up more in the final week before the coronation. Here we go then. Uh, quiet in the cheap seats. We get to form a small but an integral part of the process of crowning the sovereign. Concentrate on keeping it upright. Good, nice and steady now. Good. And yes, showing our devotion as members of the Household Division. Stand by, stand still. The part of Westminster Abbey where the coronation will take place is known as the theatre. A replica of the theatre has been built inside Buckingham Palace. Here, each stage of the ceremony is meticulously rehearsed. So we have to imagine then that the King's procession has gone in. So... Um, we're in place. We're, if, if, yes, Mr Dean, if you'd be up at the... And Archbishop of York. I'm Mark Birch. I'm the presenter of Westminster Abbey. I'm hoping at this point you will bring the fold stall out for the King. A presenter is the person who looks after the services in the Abbey. As Her Majesty comes through, Bishop's assistant moving either side of her. So that's Norwich and Hereford. And I'm trying to remember which side, which side you're on. <laughs> it's my job and other people around their Majesties uh, to make sure that they're really comfortable with all the, all the movements and all the different elements of what is quite a complicated service. So, uh, going that way, so uh, oh, okay. <laughs> across the page, uh, Norwich, perfect, yeah, on the right. I've got a huge procession of about, I think it's about 70 people, all going to different places in the Abbey, holding different things. So we've got to rehearse them very, very carefully and make sure that all the timings work as well. To familiarise themselves with their roles, 
the king and queen are attending the rehearsal. So, uh, so there, will, there will be a little bit of time while the, while the Gloria finishes, um, but at the end of the Gloria, the Archbishop will say, let us pray, and then we all stand. I, I guess we're about halfway through our rehearsal schedule. So then you're given the words to, mm -hmm. to say. Everybody's tremendously focused on getting it right, and there's just a great sense of all working together to make sure that everything runs smoothly and beautifully and gloriously as it should. This is a kneeling moment, I'm afraid. Um, if, uh, so, if your majesties would, would, would kneel, oh, then everyone else in, around you will stand. Mm -hmm. After the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. I wonder, I wonder whether they are maybe quite a long way away. They're quite a long way. We don't want to have to step. There are still bits that confuse me. I mean, the bits with the swords, uh, I still have to think through very, very carefully. And so that, that, was, that was said when you were holding it up to the altar. Oh, yes, receive this king and sword. Yes. yes, absolutely. So then I give a sword to you. Yeah. Thank you, person. You. No, my sword has to be You say a prayer. <laughs> Look at your right hand. I'm penny more. Upright. It's penny more. It's it's penny more. It's <laughs> and, and hold it upright. <laughs> it's all cloaked in the mists of medieval chivalry, and so it's not surprising that it doesn't make a lot of sense, necessarily. <laughs> So then a, a prayer of thanksgiving is made for the oil that's been brought from, from Jerusalem. And then the screens come around. What I get from these rehearsals is just clearly what a great, hugely meaningful moment this is for both of them. With the king, you get a real sense that this means everything to him. Then the dean approaches, carrying the crown with the archbishop. I say a prayer with the crown up there, mm. and then slowly lower it, tipping forward. Yes, you have to, you have to jam it on, so it has to come down to here first. Just above your eyebrows. Here sir. first, and then push down. The king has been in high-profile public life for a long, long time, but this is the moment when, when as it were, he... Ah, takes on literally the whole weight of his office, you know, the weight of that crown. It's, it's not just symbolic, <laughs> it's actual, it's about the weight of, of, of kingship. I don't want to break your neck. They won't. It'll like ruin the service. Well, I promise <laughs> it'll be, it's so huge. Yes. It's got to be on right, and I can't do anything about it. Quite. It's a role like no other that he's taking on, and I think all the ceremony and the glory of the coronation all reflects the sense of just the sheer significance of, of, of his role. I'm Graham Usher, I'm the Bishop of Norwich, and my role at the coronation is to be one of Her Majesty the Queen's bishop assistants. Your Majesty, we finally, we finally got to the... Oh, we're, we're about to crown you. Oh, you're right. That's right. <laughs> would, would you kneel for, for, the, for the anointing? Yes, right, OK. I think she's entering into it with great humility. A tiny bit of oil, I promise. Just a dab. A dab. A dab. A dab. <laughs> it is the merest dab. Mm. The merest. A day in her life that is going to be quite incredible. So um, I just dip my fingers in the end and go... I turn to the king. Indeed. Your Majesty. You've got to, you've got to say yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> you, if you don't say anything, if you don't nod or indicate, sir, I... I can't, <laughs> I can't crown Her Majesty. Don't bother to look. I'm very happy to <laughs> She has been immensely calm during the rehearsals. Also quite clear as to what she would like or how she thinks that something should be. Her sister will be standing right beside her. Yes. Her grandsons and a great nephew behind her as her pages. And I think she will be carried by that love and support of her family and the wider royal family and, and everyone gathered in Westminster Abbey. With the coronation just days away, the king and queen are inspecting their modified crowns. 
We have <laughs> Martin Swift, crown jeweler before myself. Sir. It's taken sir. months of painstaking work to alter the regalia. What we'd like to do is show you a little of what went on behind the scenes. It'd be a great deal easier to wear like that. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. What a task to have to start the chopping. Yeah. Oh. From what we can see, there are eight slit yes. pieces that have been made to make it smaller. Yeah. So I think what we're actually doing is bringing it back up to the size it used to be. But this has happened for generations. Uh, it it last been. happened, we think, in 1911. There was some alteration done to it from when we opened it up, we saw. Mm. It was very much a, a hands-on type of crown, this one. Given that it was made in 1660, by some poor souls sitting in a very cold workshop. Goodness me. Possibly with daylight, more likely by candlelight. Without it's, specs. It's, it's, yeah, yes. without specs in those days. How, it, it was, it's incredible engineering for the time, and really. And plague, and goodness knows what, and fires going on. This may not be instantly recognisable, Yes, that's a, that's a period. It is. My grandma almost had a very swelled head. Yeah. Because it wasn't, if it didn't have to be redone. Redone for that, yeah. Or do yeah. it higher, maybe higher up. Yeah. Yes. Uh, as far as we can yeah. tell, it wasn't made smaller. For yeah. So yeah. I assume yeah. that your grandfather had quite a small head as well. He did, I think. Because yeah. 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 the really interesting thing is that little... And that goes yeah, that would be on the top. Yeah. Yeah. I still have a feeling a plume went in it or something. Correct. So that is the legend that Henry V had his plume on his helmet at the Battle of Agincourt. It's so wonderful, that. Yeah, it's an it's amazing piece of history, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. To prepare for Coronation Day, Rehearsals have moved to Westminster Abbey. Up. Quick. Mark. So request, <coughs> could it not touch the gilding? OK. There's going to be a lot of business with robes on this side. Fine, so I'll just stick to the original. Please. Happy. Yeah, no so we're now at three days, I think, till the coronation. There have been so many different rehearsals. We started very small, just a small group rehearsing with the King and Queen, and that's now expanded uh, to a kind of cast of thousands. So this is the bit we've been constructing for the last week or so to enable the procession to come in without any steps onto the theatre. A rather beautiful carpet, and mm -hmm. as you can see, they've done the mouldings from the... Yeah from the choir stalls. So my name's Paul Bowman. I'm the Receiver General here, which is the equivalent of a Chief Executive uh, of the Abbey. So you'll come up here, and today we're welcoming the Princess Royal. It's changed from yesterday, Mum. The seating plan will probably change before <laughs> Saturday, so don't let's worry about it, OK? <laughs> She's coming to check the route of her procession in, and then more importantly, the route of her procession out. And yes. at that stage, um, am I joining in the procession? Yes. Right? yes. OK. I think for everybody who took part, it had to come together. And it was no good somebody going, oh, I'm just turn up on the day and read the bits of paper. It's not going to work. Right, and the Samaria door is the one down there. I'll show you. It's the one we came in, in fact. But, um, but I'll show you also the room where you can uh, leave your cape, your cloak yeah. behind. Yeah. Really want to see the route out. And I don't think it's ever worth taking somebody's word for it. The other thing is that you have to leave it late enough so that um, after the television cameras have appeared and put their wires down, that you can still get out the door you thought you were going to get out of. <laughs> you may know where you think you're going, but you know by the time the television are finished, maybe not so easy. I just remember walking into the Abbey and in every corner there were people practicing various things. It was very well <laughs> organised chaos. The other arm, other right, other arm. so we've got Louis here. Yeah. Yeah. Back here. I keep calling it a wedding. It was extraordinary because it did feel like a wedding and people kept referring to Annabelle and I as the bridesmaids, which we really didn't like very much. But it did certainly feel like a wedding because it was a family occasion. It was, 
it was in a church. It was it was very serious, and yet it had a fun side to it. <coughs> so that's on. That's and how does it feel? Everybody, wait, because it's up on the thing. Do you want us to move forward? Yeah, no, no, we want to get everybody. Somebody's got help. Yes, no, we are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Down oh, the other oh, side. They've got it. They've got it. Can you walk forward? Yeah. Yeah. She has got a great twinkle, and it comes out very readily, and it's very. It makes puts people at their ease very quickly. We had the whole rehearsal outside last night, all right long. Okay. What? The bands and the... Everything. Five o'clock till five. Right. Well, we had a little bit of I feel like sort of something that's been put in a carriage. It's like a horse. Yes. yes. So, as on the day, I, I think you'll be coming in straight... Yes. Coming in straight. Well, it's ...to Churchill. Sorry. And, and then... Uh, you're going the north side, thank you. So she knows when to be serious. And she knows when to wink at a bishop, but when not to, which I think is a rather endearing quality. Oh, yes, bishops, sorry, should have called you. Good morning, Your Majesty. Good morning, boys. Good morning. The first train that the Queen comes in, the, the wonderful Victorian red silk velvet and ermine train, it's quite heavy, apart from anything. Yes. We've got a rope at last. Good. And does it feel comfortable, Matt? Yeah. Keep, keep off the little bit. Boys, yep. I've got to get off there. Oh. Uh, uh. OK. So for those small boys, um, it was teaching them how to hold it properly, keeping it straight so that you could... It didn't bunch up as she was walking along. And it didn't pull her backwards, because if they didn't keep to the right pace with her, um, she would be pulled backwards because it was on a sort of strapped sort of thing on her shoulders. So that took a bit of getting used to. You look as if you're about to jump out of a plane and a parachute. Yes, yes, but we had a really good night because they had the whole rehearsal past our window. Oh, so you've slept so well. I slept so well. Well, at least it's not the night before, I suppose. Ahead of final rehearsals, the crown jewels have started to arrive at the Abbey. Uh, Mark, can I just feel the weight of that thing? Of course. Thank you. That's easy. That's all I needed to do. Uh, do you lift this one as well? There was a big debate about whether we should all be wearing gloves, and then it was decided that probably we were more at danger of dropping things if we were wearing gloves than without them. So, no gloves. Yeah, you can do it two hands. Yeah. They're beautifully weighted. Yes. Yeah. That's very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. The Prince of Wales has a key role in the coronation. Yes, of course. Now, wow, look at that thing. Mm -hmm. This is a chance for the prince to support the king as he prepares for his big day. I think what struck me particularly is how extraordinarily affectionate they are. They're clearly a very close family, you know, of, of all the generations. And in a sense, you felt you're part of a, a family occasion as well as, uh, you know, a royal occasion and a national occasion. Archbishop, good morning. Good morning, Your Highness. It's very nice to see you. It's Did very you? nice to see you. Oh. Your Royal Hello. Highness, how Good lovely morning. to see you. Really nice to see you too. You're on now, sir, I think. <laughs> yeah, and I've got it to looks go amazing, one. doesn't it? Oh, sorry. It's out of this world. And Garter is going to lead you up there, sir. So will you just walk, you'll just walk towards me, will you? And yes. Just walk towards you, nod, and you'll come up. And, I will and just follow him. Okay. Um. And if you ever get lost, sir, in this, you just look confident and bow. <laughs> One of the Prince of Wales' duties is to present the king with the stole royal. This garment, made of gold and silk, symbolises the sacred nature of kingship. So, Your Royal Highness, if you put the stole over the king's head, <clears throat> okay, and, we will, and then the bishops will make sure, we'll it's make sure it gets hooked on. Properly. We bring in the robe. So the robe goes on, and then, Your Royal Highness, you come and fix the clasp. She goes in there. 
Is that it? Yeah, sure. Let's try that again. It's quite a small cash. On the day, it's not going to go into yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so that works. You haven't got sausage fingers laid back. No, well, I hope I get it in the right place. <laughs> You're conscious of the deep history of Coronation Rite. We, we have been doing it uh, like this for a thousand years. You're also aware that you are seeing a little glimpse of the future. Here is a future king. What is it like for him to watch this happen? He has to be aware that you know, there will come a day when he too will be thinking about uh, uh, facing this challenge. Receive the royal scepter, the ensign of kingly power and justice. I think we'd always known that His Majesty, you know, all those years of, of Prince of Wales, how he was a man who felt things very deeply and very and very passionately, and always spoke very passionately. Um, sometimes unsettling people because he did speak with such passion. May the spirit of the Lord, who anointed Jesus at his baptism, so anoint you this day that you might exercise authority with wisdom and direct your counsels with grace, that by your service and ministry to all your people, justice and mercy may be seen in all the earth. And seeing that close up, you realize that, yeah, this is a man who believes very deeply and passionately and really cares, <laughs> really cares about things. Um, and cares about people. So the fanfare begins. He wants to give of himself for the good of others. I have a memory that is probably about as good as our spaniels. In other words, zero. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you now and no, that can't be right. Always. Always. Be a, you must have said this before. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that. Yes. <laughs> be with you and remain with you always. Oh, Amen. Amen. <laughs> he gave me a nice smile, nodded his head, um, but that was a, that was a glitch. So uh, the homage. The homage is the moment when those present pledge their allegiance to the king. So your Royal Highness, step straight in and kneel. I, William, Prince of Wales, pledge my loyalty to you and faith and truth I will bear unto you as your liege man of life and limb, so help me God. So I think the moment of the Prince of Wales kissing his father, uh, the, the, the homage, you know, it's a moment that, that, that a lot of people saw and kissed the king. <laughs> Do I stand up on here? That really wonderful connection. Yes. <laughs> Wasn't it that side? Your left side? It is normally left. the left side. This this your left cheek is better. <laughs> I mean priceless. I like, do you want to hold them, take them back? I, I think at this point you might just leave them with the bishops. And then the bishops can place them on the shrine altar. Right. So there will be a little pause there. <laughs> This thing gets great. Are you staying in the hotel? Yes, we are staying in the Nov Hotel straight opposite Lambeth Palace. Oh, is he? My wife's here as well. Good. She had to be to No, no, no. She's going to watch it on television. It's frustrating. We can't pick other no. arms of it. No. Today's rehearsals are over. You're not coming to the dress rehearsal. I'm on, on Friday, actually. George and I are back here on Friday. So I'm, I'm here Friday. tomorrow. You're here tomorrow. Yes, here. The king and queen have only two more days to practice before the big day. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. See some of you again later. <laughs> or your stand ins. <laughs> much later, really. Not much later. <laughs> With the ceremony now only hours away, the anointing oil has arrived from Jerusalem. Well, this is a moment. Isn't it just? Yes, what an extraordinary few days. It Seeing is. the Abbey come together has been absolutely marvellous. I am stunned by the work 
everyone here has done, and I've never seen it looking better. I have the oil. So oh, thank you. It. There oh. we are. Goodness I know. Me. Isn't it extraordinary? Yes. Gosh, you could make a fortune selling that. <laughs> <laughs> The king will be crowned monarch of the United Kingdom and 14 other independent nations, which are known as the Commonwealth Realms. To celebrate this bond, the king has invited the realm's leaders to a pre-coronation lunch. It's lovely, familiar faces. Thank you for coming away. It's a once-in-a-lifetime event. And we've just had the death of Her Late Majesty. And she did 70 years of exceptional service to the Commonwealth. And now she's being succeeded. And I think that he'll make a success of it. It is very important that they're there and that they want to be there, they want to be part of it, is extremely important for the future of the Commonwealth. Yes. He's a very charming person, a very warm and a very friendly person. I admire the way he communicates, he interacts with you. That, to me, speaks to the measure of, of, of our king. With well-wishers filling the streets of London, His Majesty has one more important duty to fulfill. Where did you come from? The United States. Yes, sir. Yes, we did. Special. Special. Very nice to see you. Paris, Blaine. Oh, it's happening. Hello, Lee. <laughs> Come and say hi to you, Lee, when you're back over here, but I hope you get better soon. Yeah, yeah. Have a lovely day to answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
there was just a really exciting moment of just getting them into that carriage the first time, and then we knew we were off. I mean, I thought back of, you know, being two years old and watching the Queen's coronation, you know, on a tiny black and white television. And there goes this golden coach with my sister in it. I can't explain the feeling because it's so surreal and this cannot be happening. Yeah, it was quite a moment. We were ready, we were ready, and we were ready to go out and face literally the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Going into the Abbey, I think I had that nervousness all the time. She's quite a bit smaller than I am. I'm feeling, oh my God, is she going to be all right? We often remark upon how grateful we are that our schools did a lot of drama and both of us spent time on stage. It's really good training. <laughs> Apart from the fact it gives you a bit of confidence, but it teaches you about learning lines and making sure you, you do the rehearsals and understand what's involved. So you get it absolutely right. The King took a profound interest in the coronation. There were a number of significant alterations. Lord Kamal representing British Muslims. This time, other faiths were present in a way that was inconceivable in earlier coronations. And next, Lord Patel, representing the Hindu community. There was a diversity, there was an energy about the way we were offering back to the nation and the Commonwealth what kind of a community we are. Presentation of regalia complete. The moment of crowning has arrived. Yes, it's about a man born to be king being crowned, but actually how much it says about every life and every human destiny. For me, it was about the sort of the, the human destiny under God, sort of writ, writ, writ large, um, and with, you know, the most gorgeous jewels. <laughs> God save the King! I, William, Prince of Wales, pledge my loyalty to you as your liege man of life and limb. So help me God. The Prince was sort of touching the crown. I mean, the idea of that is, it is partly about a sort of pledge that I will help, I will help you wear the crown. And I think His Majesty sort of mouth, thank you, William. She was obviously incredibly nervous. She doesn't show it a lot, but I know her well enough. No, no, I'm not at all nervous, but of course she was. I mean, you know, this is the most extraordinary moment in your life, which the whole world is going to see. There was quite a funny moment when I thought she was sort of slightly backing away from the crown, but I think that was just because she was worried that the Archbishop was going to tread on her dress, so she was just sort of pulling herself back. <laughs> I think he was very proud of her. And I think there was a sense of, I can't believe it, we've made it. What we'll do at an appropriate moment, we'll give them three cheers. And what I always do in the Navy is to throw my hand up on the right hand side. Three cheers for the king and the queen. Hip hip, hooray! Hip hip, hooray! Hip hip, hooray! That's what we do. Perfect. Okay. Now we'll have to wait. <laughs> well, it was wonderful because everybody was in the, it's a sort of grand entrance hall. 
there's all the household. And everybody gave them three cheers. Three cheers for the King and Queen. Getting back to back in Palace, what a relief. It's done and it's been brilliant. But it was sort of few, you know, almost take your shoes off. <laughs> well, like, ask any actor who comes off stage, you know, having done a performance that they really put a lot, a lot into, um, is that kind of relief. <laughs> And then to walk out to the terraces to see, I think it was four and a half thousand soldiers lined up in immaculate order. Three cheers for His Majesty, the King, and Her Majesty, the Queen. He just loved that moment. There was such an air of celebration. I mean, it's rather sort of cliche, but you could sort of feel the love. And then this extraordinary thing, which certainly we weren't expecting, being called out onto the balcony. The king and the queen will go out first, followed by with the pages, followed by your Royal Highnesses, the Royal Fizz, and then the rest of the royal family. Looking up the mall, this amazing noise and the sea of faces and the cheering, I mean, it was mind-blowing. There's a wonderful shot just of the two of them. I mean, it makes me cry thinking of it. Um, there they are. With the coronation over, it's back to work for the royal household. But there are summer highlights, which everyone looks forward to. I'm a coachman at the Royal Muse, and we're just preparing for day three of Royal Ascot. It's the first big event since the coronation. Today, we're running three bay teams, that's 12 horses, with just a grey team in front for the king and the queen. So in Windsor Great Park, the royal family get out of the cars and into the carriages. And then once all the guests are in the carriages, we'll be given a hats off and off we go. Hello and welcome to Royal Ascot for day three here at the most famous race course on the planet. Today is a poignant moment for the King. 
This is his first Royal Ascot without his mother. She was a passionate lover of racing. The late Queen had a tremendous ability to understand the horse from when she was a princess, very young. She loved the breeding side of it and tried to develop a horse, as she once said, that can just run faster than someone else's. The King and the Queen have very much committed themselves to, to carry on the mantle, which the late Queen set up for them to inherit. The King has a horse running in one of the big races of the day. All right, we're underway. The King George V Stakes, the one mile four furlong race, and we've got some local interest in this. Desert Hero is owned by the King. It's gonna be quite tough. Burglar is the favorite here, ridden by Frankie de Tori. Champion jockey Frankie de Tori is racing against the King's horse. And here comes the King's horse dashing through the middle. It could be a win for His Majesty the King. Yes, it is! Royal Ascot, very royal, as Desert Hero becomes the first winner for King Charles III and Queen Camilla. He came from absolutely nowhere. For the King and Queen to have got themselves a gold medal, as, uh, I mean, it brought the house down. They had tears in their eyes in the box. They were so touched by it. Well done. First Royal Asco win. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it wasn't it? Come on, you wouldn't. My mouse was tiny and I was looking at yours and he was weaving his way for it, but I couldn't really tell if it won or not. And when I heard the cheers, it is definitely one. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, Brilliant. Yeah, Brilliant. Yeah, Brilliant. Yeah, you could get through all that. And how close was it? Brilliant. 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 How amazing. First year, boom, winner. Right? right? Yeah. My late mama won this race in 1955. Oh my God! Mm. So she would have been so thrilled. I know. Okay. I, I think she'd be more thrilled for you to be here for five days straight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think I could do another window. It's all a bit too much. I think so we should so make our way to the palace yes. Come on. before I miss my ride. Really all right. Of course, we're all waiting for Frankie de Tori to see if he might get a win as well because it's his final Royal Ascot. Courage Mon Ami is six to one. At the moment, so Frankie de Tori with a chart. We've had the King winning, so we now want a Frankie winner. That would just top the day off. Yeah, not out the question. So they're heading down the hill. Keep an eye on Courage Mon Ami, who's coming well. Frankie de Tori, this could be his crowning glory at Royal Ascot. We've got Coltrane, the local horse, up against Courage Mon Ami into the final furlong. They're neck and neck. Frankie de Tori slides ahead. Courage Mon Ami takes over the running. And it's Courage Mon Ami and Frankie de Tori, his crowning glory at Royal Ascot. A ninth gold cut win. Who writes that man's script? <laughs> This is a double whammy. We've got the King presenting the trophy to Frankie de Tori. An incredible scenes down here. I think Queen Elizabeth would be very proud of her son, King Charles, that he's had his first winner, that he's supporting what she loved for so many years, horse racing. He's really took Royal Ascot on board and he's enjoyed the whole package and may long continue. It's late summer, and the countryside is in bloom. The king is enjoying one of his passions, nature. Today, he's visiting a stretch of coastline, which is being named in his honor. We're at one of England's 220 national nature reserves. This one was first established in 1968. But right now, Natural England is working with partners to make this reserve much, much bigger, to make a super national nature reserve covering more than 30 square kilometers. Because what we're in the process of doing in England at the moment is moving beyond what we used to call conservation and moving into a period of nature recovery. 
So this is a new generation of national nature reserves, and that new generation we're calling the King's Series. Has it got better and better? Than... Well, this is June grassland, and uh, this habitat is fantastic for yeah. insects of yeah. all kinds, including yeah. butterflies. And also, and, a toad, uh, and here we are, look, um, here we are. Oh, now, this is a, this is a very rare species, you'll mm. be aware. Yes. Natterjack yes. toad. Natterjack yeah. toad with the yellow stripe. They were uh, originally found mm. in quite a lot of Lincolnshire, oh. in the Fenland as well as, well as along the coast. Yeah. But, and now we just have the one population in Lincolnshire. Because of the loss of their habitat, presumably. Yes. But we've had a really good success story. It's, um, it's, the population is booming oh, at the yes. moment. One of the things about King Charles's contribution on the environmental side is that not only has he got enormous depth to what he thinks and says about all of this, but also enormous longevity on his contribution, of course. We are faced at the moment with the horrifying effects of pollution in all its cancerous forms. Right now, up to 15 million people are at risk in the dry lands of Africa. The conclusion I draw is that the future of mankind can be assured only if we rediscover ways in which to live as part of nature, not apart from her. He is, I think, possibly the most significant environmentalist the world has seen, given that he's been doing this for 50 years, and he's been ahead of the curve on pretty much every single subject. It's well. rather wonderful to see quite so many butterflies at the moment, yes. but suddenly... Yes. You've timed your visit very well. The sun's just come out. We've got some butterflies at the front. Yeah, well you don't need to go through them. Yeah, sure. We yeah. had the Essex skipper in the front. Oh, an Essex skipper. Which is lovely. Yeah. Mm. Ah. And we know it's an Essex skipper because of the antennas. Mm -hmm. Would you like that. to release one? I'd simply love to. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Which one? We have the gatekeeper, if you'd yes. like to release. Right. Just yes. simply open, just turn yeah. the top. Okay. Yes. Engine. Yeah, imagine with the sun out, it'd be quite keen yeah, to fly away. Yeah. Yeah. There we go, lovely. <laughs> I think his motivation comes from his love of nature, his continuing interactions with nature, and the fact that we still can make a difference if we wish to. In England, there's no really, truly wild habitat left. So we do have to intervene and we do need to manage in order to hang on to these wonderful species of animals and plants that we have here. Yeah, I could agree more. Yes. Yeah. But of course, half the thing has been the, the combination of, of man and nature exactly. over all these generations, which produce so many of the fascinating habitats and species that have come. And the, exactly. how to maintain that sort of yes. relationship seems to me the important thing. Like all environmentalists, the king, I think, is an optimist. Considering the effort that he still puts in to trying to get people to come together and think about solutions, you have to be an optimist to want to invest the time in that kind of process. So I think we need to um, wander down yeah. here, I just think. Right. It's kind of wonderful to see that sea lavender, isn't it? There? It's lovely, isn't it? Just a short moment when you can see it. Exactly. Yeah. And up here, look, we just have a kestrel to there he is. wave us farewell as we walk down. <laughs> <laughs> Those keen eyes. <laughs> the King and Queen's first year is nearing its end, and the pace has been unrelenting.
It's September, and the king and queen have returned to Balmoral to recharge their batteries. I think Scotland is where they both relax. He's been there all his life for long summer holidays, and I think she has really grown to love it. Officially, this is royal downtime. Yeah. But for the king, the day job continues. Mr. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning sir. Um, ah. <laughs> another day, another box. Uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> exactly. So the red boxes come in pretty much every day of the year, except Christmas Day and Easter Monday. It is quite an interesting crop today, which is, yeah, really? is handy. Yeah. They contain all of the documents that the king's going to have to look at, be they from the government, from the church, from the military. The Foreign Secretary asks if Your Majesty would send a message to the King of Sweden, who's, can you believe it, it's his golden jubilee yes. in the middle of this, of this month. Oh, great. Is this in Swedish? Yes, James. Splendid. So I hope that's right, is it the Swedish? Is it? Well, <laughs> I see it is. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> no, you never know if somebody's fed you something <laughs> frightful <laughs> to say. That would be very... I have no idea that you've done it. <laughs> I don't know exactly. So the king is an incredibly hard worker. I think that's one of the things that pretty much everybody knows about him. He works till very late at night, often well beyond midnight. Here we are. Thank you very much, sir. Then we move on to the Ministry of Defence. And of course, after 50 years as, as, as Prince of Wales, he's developed huge experience and expertise and an incredibly wide range of issues and interests. It's always quite fun looking through to see if I can find names, you know, which remind me of people I served with yes. in the Navy who may have sons. I mean, I did find one last year. Oh. So that's interesting, that name. Yes. Because he'd been a commanding officer of a mine hunter at the same time as I had. God, how's And when I, I asked, and it, and it was true, it was his, his son who'd become an army. It was his son. It shows how long ago. <laughs> anyway, so I wrote to, to, to my own friend and said, I'm so glad to discover this. Challenge as always with these things to make sure we know. Not to put your great finger on it. <laughs> exactly. Which has happened. It has indeed, uh, sir. It has indeed. Yeah. It's a tradition that every September, the monarch invites some special guests to Balmoral. Oh, Prime Minister. How are you? Good evening, Your Majesty. Very nice, nice to meet you again. Good evening, nice Your Majesty. Hello. Hello. Nice Lovely to meet you. Thank you for having us. How were the games? Oh, they were splendid. Yeah. At least, quite at funny. least it was reasonably dry. It is not you know, my usual weekly audience. It's a group of friends, family, invited guests who are staying for a weekend. Lots of dinners, lunches, lots of walks. Fantastic. And lots of eating. I mean, a lot of food. <laughs> anyway, figure out how to work up an appetite in the next couple of hours before yeah, dinner. God, I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> God, yeah. sent you out for a run. Right, that's what Johnny was saying. But yeah. it's such a nice evening, actually. I think it's been an incredibly successful year. I mean, I've had the pleasure and the privilege of spending time with him over that year. And I've just seen him do it in his own way, as, of course, he should do, and do it brilliantly. Mm -hmm. I just love the way the, all the sun comes through the katinas. Yeah, it's marvelous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What's this one here? Hmm? Ah. Which one? They Which are one? an extraordinary yeah. team, and I think it's whether they've sort of had to fight to get there or whether it's just because they've been through a lot together and it's made them have a really strong bond. Where's your ball there? There. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't leave it. They're all busily eating grass. What are you doing? Uh, she loves eating grass. Mm. I think it's so green for the day. They're both huge walkers, very fit, both of them. That's how well exercised. Her with her mad dogs. The last time she was in here, she found a, a, a mice. I know she, and she, the whole lot, she, yeah, horrible yeah, little creatures. Yeah, she, reappeared a yeah. bit later. She is his rock. And I can't actually emphasize that enough. She's somebody who is completely loyal and she isn't somebody who has huge highs and lows. 
he brings to her everything. I'm not talking about all of this, but, you know, he has such a knowledge and interest in so many different things, which she wouldn't really have been open to if she hadn't met him. It's not great to bite this on that bridge. Every child, when it comes here, they rush there and are about to spout on the bridge for hours. I can't, you can't get it to come. You know, they're, they're yin and yang, really. They, they really are polar opposites, but I think it works brilliantly. Most of us, as we get to this sort of age of thinking, yes, quiet times, but theirs is just gonna go like that, isn't it? Thank you.